Your Highness, Your Excellencies, distinguished friends, guests, and colleagues, good morning and welcome to the 18th Doha Forum. We thank you very much for being here for what is sure to be two days um, of dynamic, extraordinary, provocative at times, discussion and networking. If we're going to spend two days together, I should introduce myself. My name is Rochelle Carey. I'm a presenter with Al Jazeera English, and I'm really honored to be your guide for the next uh, two days. So this year, the forum has launched a new visual identity that is staying true to Doha as a platform for diversity, dialogue, and diplomacy. The theme this year is shaping policy in an interconnected world. So we have partnered with some of the world's best institutions to ensure an enriching and engaging experience. On behalf of the forum, I would like to thank our platinum sponsors, Qatar Petroleum, Qatar National Bank, as well as our official telecommunications partner, Oridu. So we have a, a short video that we're going to show that kind of sets the stage uh, for the next two days and rolls out the themes for the 18th Doha Forum. So I'm going to step aside and you all take a look at the video. In these turbulent times, the world faces many great challenges, challenges which require us all to work together through dialogue and diplomacy, all the while capitalizing on diversity of opinion and approach. That's why leaders, thinkers and policymakers come together at Doha Forum to address these critical issues and promote action-oriented recommendations. When we work together, share our perspectives and innovative solutions, we can advance policies that matter. This year, Doha Forum explores four key themes. Security, economic development, peace and mediation, trends and transitions. Today's world is more interconnected than ever, yet it's also more fragmented if we can join hands and minds Together, we can rise to these challenges and define tomorrow's opportunities. Doha Forum 2018, shaping policy in an interconnected world. So you're going to hear that repeated a lot over the next couple of days, shaping policy in an interconnected world. So without further ado, we have the honor of having His Highness Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, the Emir of Qatar here, to deliver an opening speech, Your Highness. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ashab al-Fakhama. والمعالي والسعادة السيدات والسادة أرحب بكم جميعا في منتدى الدوحة الثامن عشر الذي سيتناول عددا من أهم القضايا الاقتصادية والاجتماعية والتحديات السياسية في عالمنا اليوم حضور كرام أطلق سمو الأمير الوالد منتدى الدوحة في العام 2000 بوصفه منصة حوار عالمية في مطلع الألفية الجديدة حين بشرت الأمم المتحدة بمبادئ عهد جديد من التعاون الأممي توافق عليها المجتمع الدولي فبعد نهاية الحرب الباردة واستنتاجات العالم من المذابح في رواندا وبروندي والبلغان بدأ أنه سينشأ نظام للأمن الدولي يمكن أيضا من التعاون الذي تتضافر فيه الجهود لإيجاد الحلول للتحديات المختلفة في مجالات التعليم والصحة والتنمية ولكن توالت التحديات والأزمات في العالم من أحداث 11 سبتمبر وانتشار ظاهرة الإرهاب والعنف والتطرف إلى الأزمة العالمية لأسواق المال وظاهرة التغير المناخي والاحتباس الحراري وانتقلنا من الحديث عن المواطنة العالمية إلى القلق من تسيس رهاب الأجانب عبر الحركات الشعبوية التي تحشد الجمهور على أساس الانتماءات الأثنية القطرية والدينية والطائفية كما انتقلنا من التفاؤل بعولمة الأسواق 
وإلغاء الحدود إلى التعامل مع السياسات الاقتصائية الحمائية لقد عادت النزاعات الإقصائية والشمولية تجتاح عالمنا وأنتجت أنظمة لا تعترف بأبسط حقوق الإنسان وتتضاعف جسامة هذه التحديات أمام ما يكتنف النظام الدولي الراهن من التجاذبات السياسية المتصاعدة ذات الأثر السلبي على التعاون الدولي والانتقائية في معالجة بعض القضايا واللجوء أحياناً إلى استخدام القوة وتنامي العنصرية بكافة أشكالها وفي هذا السياق فإن القمع والاستبداد وازدواجية المعايير التي تفرغ مبادئ العدالة من مضمونها وانتهاك حقوق الإنسان وحرياته الأساسية أصبحت تمثل تهديداً للإنسانية أو ما يمكن تسميته بالأمن الإنساني فالاستغرار لا يجوز أن يقوم على القمع والظلم مثلما أن السلم الحقيقي هو القائم على العدل لا على الاحتلال كما أن المفهوم الضيق للأمن يشكل خطراً على الأمن ذاته لأن انعدام الأمن الإنساني يعود فيهدد الأمن والاستقرار بمفهومهما الضيق ومثلما ليس من الممكن تحقيق تنمية اقتصادية على المدى البعيد بدون التنمية البشرية كذلك من الضروري تحقيق الأمن بكافة أبعاده الاقتصادية والسياسية والبيئية والمجتمعية بالنسبة لنا هذه مقولات نظرية بالنسبة لنا ليست هذه مقولات نظرية فلنا في منطقة الشرق الأوسط نصيب من التحديات والأزمات فمن القضية الفلسطينية والصراع العربي الإسرائيلي إلى حرب العراق إلى الانتفاضات العربية التي أطلق عليها عالمياً تسمية الربيع العربي ومن مشكلات الهجرة والبطالة إلى قضايا الأمن المجتمعي والأمن الغذائي وغيرها من التحديات في خضم كل هذه التحديات والأزمات ثبت أنه لم لم يكتب النجاح لأية حلول من خارج, من خارج مجموع القيم الجامعة التي توصلت إليها الإنسانية بعد الحرب العالمية الثانية من جهة وبعد معارك التحرر من الاستعمار من جهة أخرى وهي القيم التي لا يجوز أن تتغير بتغيير الظروف والأوقات وقد صيغت هذه القيم الجامعة في مواثيق الأمم المتحدة ومبادئها والهادفة إلى حفظ الأمن والسلم الدوليين واللجوء إلى الحوار والوسائل السلمية لحل المنازعات ورفض ضم أراضي الغير بالقوة وحق تغرير المصير للشعوب وعدم التدخل في الشؤون الداخلية للدول ورفض كافة أشكال العنصرية والتمييز واحترام حقوق الإنسان والمواطن والتمسك بقيم العدالة والمساواة ونبذ التطرف والإرهاب وتعزيز التعايش السلمي والتعاون الدولي لقد فات عرابي وأصحاب التفكير الإقصائي الضيق الأفق أن التطور التكنولوجي والفضاء الإلكتروني المفتوح جعل من الصعب احتكار الكلمة وتكميم الأفواه وإيماناً منا بأهمية الكلمة وضرورة الحوار وحتمية التنوع فقد حرصنا كل الحرص على إبقاء منابر الحوار ومنصات التواصل فعالة منفتحة لتبادل الأراء في بيئة حرة للجميع على اختلاف انتماءاتهم الفكرية ورؤاهم السياسية ومنتداكم هذا هو مثال على ذلك الحوار هو الذي يجسر الهوى بين الفرقاء مهما اشتدت الخلافات وهو نقطة الابتداء ونقطة الانتهاء في هذا الزمن الصعب وينطبق ذلك على أزمة الخليج المتمثلة بحصار بلادنا والتي لم يتغير موقفنا في حلها برفع الحصار وحل الخلافات بالحوار القائم على الاحترام المتبادل وعدم التدخل في الشؤون الداخلية للدول فمسألة التعايش وحشل الجوار بين الدول منفصلة عن أي قضايا عن أي قضايا أخرى السيدات والسادة إن لديكم جدول أعمال على جدول أعمال على جانب من الثراء والشمول في ظل التحديات التي تواجه المجتمع الدولي 
آملوا أن تسهم أعمال هذا المنتدى في بلورة الرؤى بشأن كيفية التعامل مع القضايا والموضوعات المهمة المطروحة للنقاش فيها أكرر الترحيب بكم في الدوحة متمنين لكم طيب الإقامة والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Thank you, Your Highness. So it is time to welcome to the stage our next speaker, His Excellency Lenin Marino, the President of Ecuador. His Highness, His Excellencies, thank you very much for your welcome. Thank you, thank you very much for your kindness. Dear friends and colleagues from all around the world, the Doha Forum has been, since its inception in the year 2000, a fantastic global platform aimed at achieving one of the most ambitious and important goals for our contemporary world, which is to establish a global dialogue, as His Highness was saying, a conversation among people from all over the world in order to share and draw agreements on the main challenges that our planet is facing. You will certainly agree with me if I say that it is surprising, to say the least, that many of such challenges not only are still valid, but in many cases have aggravated. The Doha's forum raison d'etre is still valid now as it was 18 years ago. I fully agree with the theme of this 18th edition that gathers us here. And may I add that it is a paradox that today, more than ever, our world has never been so interconnected and globalized, while at the same time it appears to be more fragmented. Many critical issues are still prevailing and new challenges are threatening us. I have been in office at the presidency of my country for 18 months now, and I can say, not without a certain satisfaction, and it is sometimes something I view as a continuous battle, that dialogue, dialogue in Ecuador and among Ecuadorians is some sort of trademark of my government. Only those human beings that communicate among themselves, who express their feelings and interests, who understand the feelings and interests of the others, are able to live together, are able to build up communities, and can help each other and reach peace. I really like to quote uh, Paulo Freire, the great Brazilian educator, when he says that the wonder of dialogue lies in its capacity to establish a relationship of, of sympathy between two opposite poles, two opposite points that were thought to be extreme opposites, but that can always, always establish a connection, a dialogue, so that we can receive the opinions of every single one of us. This is what we should aim at with respect, respecting all kinds of diversity. The world is very different and we have to learn to enjoy this diversity. It would be so boring to have a world in which we don't have this extreme diversity that we enjoy. So diversity is there to be enjoyed, not to be suffered. 
and we can always always establish a connection. And I like this idea because the young generations are perfectly able to understand it, since they do everything, since they do everything, absolutely everything through the networks, cyberspace, and through the interconnectivity of the smartphones. It would have been reasonable to expect that such proximity brought about by the internet and holograms and virtual reality could have brought us closer to one another. To what end? Well, for a dialogue to exist, it is essential to communicate, but communication is not enough. A real dialogue demands that one tries to understand the other, looking for common ground, where our own interests can coexist with those of our neighbors, or even try to create common interests that can gather us under shared goals, always shared goals. Nevertheless, the harsh reality is that very often modern interconnectivity, the internet and the social networks, not only have they isolated our closest and dearest, like our family members, but they have also exacerbated differences, exclusions and borders between peoples or individuals that think differently. Of course, I'm not going to make the mistake of blaming technology or science uh, because we very often, we know that uh, science and technology are not to blame for the highly fragmented human communities. And of course, uh, we are responsible to uh, responsible use. Because it is up to us as individuals and as nations to decide to which aim and how to use the inventions that we support, use, and yet sometimes criticize. And I would like to highlight that science and technology are not to blame for uh, the use we made of it. Let's remember that Albert Einstein, the German scientist, was in horror when he found out the atomic bombs caused uh, havoc in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Therefore, this is why it comes as no surprise that those challenges I was alluding to still prevail. They are still at the heart of the debate, high on the international agenda, the challenge of looking for agreements that would lead us to a sustainable economic development to tackle climate change, to reach real inclusion, democracy, respect for human rights, children's protection, the fight against violence, the fight against corruption that undermines democracies and our children's future. There are international issues and disputes that have been dragging on since the last century. Those issues are still the same while new ones are emerging. Whatever the human species will do with itself will determine the future of this big house that, that is our planet. We are all responsible of our own history and nobody else but ourselves will live our lives. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, the French existentialist, used to say that the human being is condemned to be free he said that there's not human essence or a human nature, but it is to us to make this human essence, this human nature, we are responsible of our coexistence. Today, in the light of the fourth industrial revolution, we have to accept that we are condemned. We are condemned to reach an understanding we have to reach agreements. And then again, as uh, His Highness was saying, the respect is very important, respect to different opinions, respect to diversity, because humanity is a long history of conflicts and difficulties that have been overcome. And our role as government leaders and policymakers is to turn uncertainty into certainty as far as it is possible. We should not only 
we shouldn't forget that we have a large rank of possibilities. We should really project ourselves into the future. Sometimes some kind of certainties become the jail of our own thoughts, our actions. So in any case, our peoples expect from us this capability, and this is what this Doha Forum is about. Because what is important in these gatherings is not trying to find out whether there are going to be conflicts or not, but rather how to face them. Every people, every country has its own long history, very often shared with others. And this history should teach us what we should not do again. We should strive to attain such wisdom. I believe that such basic principles for the coexistence of humanity will pave the way to progress of societies and science, human development and prosperity of nations. We need societies that live in harmony and in solidarity, societies that establish a dialogue and learn to overcome their differences. It is equally important to teach our children how to read and write, as it is to teach them how to be tolerant and look for the common interest of humanity, to be respectful, how to take care of the others, the common interest of humanity, to take care of the environment, to look for and especially to reach agreements in order to solve disputes with others by peaceful means and showing a big respect to different opinions. Different opinions are here to be enjoyed, not to be suffered. We shouldn't consider different opinions as a suffering, but we have to enjoy it. And we have to enjoy this wonderful life that has been given to us. We need sciences that are more human, technologies that are used to improve the quality of life and not used only to make more expensive toys for wealthy children. We need science for the good of humanity and particularly for those who need it the most those who are marginalized. Therefore, we need human beings who are free to accomplish their dreams and who look for and indeed find happiness. We need prosperous nations in the sense that they offer more opportunities for those who have less. In one of his latest books, Jorge Luis Borges, the great Argentinian writer, wrote, there is a conspiracy in the heart of Europe, and he was referring to 1291, 1291. He was saying, this is a conspiracy when men from different origins with different religions and languages with different views, they have taken the strange decision of becoming reasonable. These thoughts are so valid. Those people who have decided to become reasonable, to become sensible, have decided to put aside their differences and strengthen their affinities. We should also take this strange decision of becoming sensible, reasonable, and decide to forget our differences and strengthen our affinities. I invite you then to agree to agree. That is, we should agree upon things that are possible to make an agreement on, to sign a compact inviolable in nature by which we commit to reach a robust, unwavering agreement. I invite you to agree that our first priority should be the poorest, those who have always been excluded, the forgotten ones among the forgotten, the wretched of the earth, as Franz Fanon used to say. They are 
entitled to be happy as we are all. The human being is all the more human when he turns his eyes to his fellow men, when he acts as a real brother of, to all his brothers. I invite you then to agree on the fact that a good government should care for every single one of uh, each human being, without exception, all along their lives, since the moment we are conceived until God decides it is time for us to live. I invite you to agree on the fact that the critical decisions, state policies and policies among states need to be undertaken with a shared citizen core responsibility. Because if a government is not shared by all and cares for all with the participation of all, I'm particularly uh, talking about the most vulnerable and helpless ones, it doesn't deserve to be called a government and even less a democracy. This is where dialogue is useful. This is where we find the new history of diplomacy and the richness of diversity. Dear friends and colleagues of the world, present here. Let this 18th edition of the Doha Forum be the beginning of an agreement to agree, an agreement that compels us in full awareness with a humanistic spirit to agree to reach the highest goals that humankind needs at this moment in <coughs> history. I don't ask you to write a new history, but Let's not do this new history. We have many uh, narratives, but let's build the best history for our peoples. Thank you very much. His Excellency, the President of Ecuador, thank you very much. So I would like to bring to the stage now our next speaker, Your Excellency, the President of the United Nations General Assembly, Maria Fernanda Espinosa Garces. <laughs> Your Highness Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, Emir of the State of Qatar, Your Excellency Lenin Moreno, President of the Republic of Ecuador, Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Salam Alaikum, Sabak Al Khair, Good morning. It is a pleasure to join you for the 2018 Doha Forum which has become, over the past 18 years, one of the most vibrant platforms for global dialogue and for addressing the challenges facing the current world. Let me begin by congratulating the organizers for convening such a diverse group of participants. I also commend for organizing the first youth edition of the Doha Forum last month. One of my priorities as president of the General Assembly is precisely young people. They are key to solving the challenge we face, and their voices must not only be heard, but listened to and acted upon. And there is no shortage of challenges. Multiple crises, environmental, political, economic, and social, are fueling instability across the globe. Today, member states of the United Nations must confront challenges that the organization's founder, founders could not have imagined, from cybersecurity to climate change. But they must also face problems that would have been all too familiar to a generation pummeled by two world wars, such as populism, 
rising nationalism sentiment and mass displacement. Across the world, almost 70 million people have been forced to leave their homes, fleeing bombs, guns, rape, poverty, and starvation. Last year, nearly one person was forcibly displaced every two seconds as a result of conflict or persecution. I came here from Marrakesh, Morocco, where a few days ago, member states gathered at the highest political level and adopted the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration, the first agreement designed to better manage international migration in all its dimensions for the benefit of all states and communities and with the rights of all migrants at the core. Today, there are over 258 million migrants around the world living outside their country of birth. Together with the Global Compact on Refugees, these agreements constitute a remarkable achievement of international cooperation and multilateralism. Next week, I will convene member states in New York to formally take action on the two compacts, which reflect the fundamental principles of humanity and solidarity, but also the benefits of our interconnectedness. So I welcome the themes of this forum, security, peace and mediation, economic development, and trends and transitions. Security is at the heart of the United Nations, a promise that we, the peoples, expressed in the Charter and reaffirmed count, uh, countless times by member states from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, whose 70th anniversary we celebrated this week, to the mandates of the Blue Helmets and Agenda 2030 of Sustainable Development and its central commitment to peaceful, equitable, and sustainable societies. Sadly, the international community has failed too often to uphold this promise, failures that cause untold suffering and have deprived millions and millions of people of the fruits of sustainable development, and the rest of the world suffers with them. We cannot achieve the ambitious sustainable development goals when conflict and instability limit the gains of cooperation and threaten to reverse the hard-won progress we have made to date. The international community needs to do more to support peace and mediation. Dialogue is the only tried and tested approach to addressing global challenges. This is particularly the case where peace and security issues are concerned. They increasingly, increasingly span borders and regions and cannot be addressed or contained by any one country or indeed by countries alone. The inclusion of women and young people is critical both for the success of the peace and security agenda and to the realization of the sustainable development goals. We must collectively work to empower women and youth by supporting their participation in peace and political processes and by creating greater economic opportunities. Excellencies, the Sustainable Development Goals represent the commitment of our international community to end poverty and hunger, improve the health and well-being of millions of people around the world, and leave no one behind. While we safeguard the environment for the current and future generations as well. To achieve this, it is essential that we renew the foundations of cooperation for development, including South-South cooperation. Between 1995 and 2016, South-South exports grew each, each year by an average of 13% with the value of South-South trade increasing almost sevenfold to $4 trillion during the same period. 
next year's high-level meeting of the United Nations on South-South Cooperation in Buenos Aires and the third South Summit to be hosted by Uganda with the support of the Qatar Fund for Development will be important occasions to strengthen these essential partnerships. Another priority area is the access to decent work. I plan a high-level meeting on decent work together with the International Labour Organization to agree on policy changes required to ensure that all people, including women, youth, and persons with disabilities, benefit from access to decent work. This will require active engagement around prevailing and emerging trends, such as the impact of new technologies on the nature and future of work and the backlash we are seeing against globalization, even as the world grows ever more interconnected. Globalization has boosted opportunities for trade and development, but it has also increased our, our vulnerability to shocks from bank defaults to disease outbreaks and left too many people feeling marginalized. They have lost faith in the ability of national and global institutions to keep them safe and improve their lives. To date, Neither the United Nations nor traditional political es establishments have succeeded in addressing this sense of insecurity. Many policymakers are overwhelmed by the sheer scale and intensity of the challenges we face. Some of them have turned inwards, too preoccupied with domestic concerns to invest in the global solutions we so urgently need. This, in turn, is being exploited by those who seek to attribute people's daily struggles to the failure of multilateral institutions. The world is at a highly complex transition point. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said that we have just 12 years for global warming to be kept, kept to a maximum 1.5 degrees Celsius to avoid drought, extreme heat and poverty for hundreds of millions of people. Earlier this week, the International Monetary Fund issued warnings about a new financial crisis at a time when countries are still recovering from the last. Geopolitical tensions are on the rise. So too is inequality. Meanwhile, humanitarian and migratory crises show few signs of slowing. All of these demands our full, require our full attention in order to reach agreements and solutions that are effective. I was encouraged to hear heads of state and government repeatedly emphasize the need for a stronger multilateral system at the General Assembly last September. The adoption of the Global Compact on Migration in Marrakesh demonstrates that states can still come together and make progress, even on some of the most challenging issues we all face. Our Highness, Excellencies, making the United Nations relevant to all people is the theme that I have chosen for this session of the General Assembly and I am working with member states to put in place the reform processes that are underway and revitalize the United Nations and its General Assembly. We must move towards a global governance system that is democratic and effective. That also implies building a fairer and more equitable world order. So there is much work to do over these two days of the forum and I look forward to fruitful discussions that reinforce the truth that multilateralism is essential for promoting national interest and the well-being of all in an inter interconnected world. There is a verse by Qatar's founder that I hope will guide us. We have been plighted by many serious adversities, yet there has neither weakened our firm, our firm will nor our stances." End of quote. At this time of great challenge for the world, 
I invite you all to show similar resolve in our efforts to build a more peaceful, equitable, and sustainable world. Thank you very much.